Hey there, friends. Mixed Punk Rogers here, kicking off our very first episode of Freaks and Ferals, the Firekeepers podcast. In this episode, I sit in conversation with the extraordinary Inkem Indefo, a beacon in the holistic social healthcare landscape. Inkem's work as a mentor, facilitator, teacher, nurse midwife, and the visionary behind the Resilience Toolkit and Lumos Transforms spans the globe and centers on helping communities craft bridges between ancient wisdom and revolutionary practice for thriving amidst change and upheaval. Currently, she leads Embody Labs certification programs and directs both the Resilience Toolkit certification program and Lumos's innovative organizational consulting and community programs. I absolutely love talking with her and enjoy feeling into the expansive ways that she envisions our collective healing and how the big and bold can be expressed through the small and subtle. We unpack some big ideas, navigating the collective grown zone that we're in, valuing the process as much as the outcome, embedding equity into our daily practices, defining the essence of community care, and envisioning a liberatory future together. It's about shifting from me to us, and that's the true fire of trauma-informed living. So let's light it up. So warm welcome, Inkem. Um, thank you so much for joining us. One of the things I love about your teaching style is that you always start out by asking, why is this important? Um, which is really important for my uh, autistic brain to have context, right? In order to be engaged, in order to engage myself in the learning. So, uh, so I guess my first question is, why do we need embodied, trauma-informed, resilience-oriented principles in our lives? I don't know if there's a short answer to this one. Um, I'm gonna think about the simplest and Long shortest. Answer, right? You know, the, a simple answer here is I find mm -hmm. that um, there's so many different approaches. Like, are you going to do anti-racism? Are you going to do somatics? Are you going to do this? Are you going to do like these different ways? And I find that this is a holistic approach that answers many of the, are you addressing climate change? Are you, I guess there's so many things, climate crisis, like wh which, which of the things that you're addressing and that this is such a holistic perspective that in ways it's an antidote to the crisis, the poly crisis that we are in right now of, um, mm -hmm. on every different level. Um, and it's not just an antidote, it's like a, I'm trying to think of what the word might be. It's a dream, it's a vision. So it's not just pushing against, it actually is creating something different. So when I think about the principles um, of safety and mutuality and cultural humility, and I think about like when you, and choice, and I, you start to put them together as ingredients in a soup, what the flavor is, is a liberatory flavor. Uh, it's one that both dismantles that which is oppressive, that which is, um, constraining that which is dehumanizing uh, and also creating this liberatory connected vital just sustainable place when those principles are centered in the ways that we think and feel and move and relate and so the reason why that's important is because of the poly crisis <laughs> yeah so it's like um it's it's almost like it's a dissolver of things that don't work and an infuser of 
things that do. Mm-hmm. And and it, it invites like humility, you know, so humility is to me is like, it's a posture that allows an unfolding. So it's not a rigid that like, here's the answers. It invites questions. It invites exploration. It, it invites the possibilities to mm. learn and unlearn Choices. and um, create and practice and make mistakes. It's like, it's all there. Mm. I think when I first started learning these tools, the word agency was really big in mm-hmm. my mind getting agency really for the first time. And I think that's what you're, I hear in what you're Mm -hmm. saying is having, um, and I've heard you say a menu of choices as well. And it's like, it's not agency in the sense of like a neoliberal individualized, it's my freedom, (laughs) right? It's Mm -hmm. like our freedom tied together. Like how do we get free Mm -hmm. together? as opposed to in a a very individual, because otherwise you're setting people's needs up against each other. Not a fan, not a fan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can we talk a little bit about co-regulation? Because it feels like that's what's uh, really almost like the food and the medicine contained within relationship or within community and yeah, and you're you're talking about that now. That's part of the why, right? Is to get to that kind of that food or that medicine of co-regulation. I mean, we're always co-regulating. It's just a question in what direction, right? Mm, so, same. right, Please, like yeah. you know, when people work themselves up into a lather and everyone's panicking, they're co-regulating, <laughs> right? They're just ramping themselves yes. up. Um, yes you know so we're always relating to each other in in some fashion even in response even if I shut down like you're doing something and I shut down and push out I'm in response to you and so it's how to create a more um, um, attuned Right? Attuned, like we're aware of how we're impacting each other. So there's an awareness that's happening um, and mm-hmm. a gentle connection, mm-hmm. an interest in supporting each other's like calm presence, um, an interest in slowing down together. I think of those as mm-hmm. the direction that I would be interested in. Um, because most people are moving so fast. They're moving so fast. Even like the folks who are like, yeah. you know, the allies and the comrades, they're moving so fast. <laughs> like what's being missed? Um, the urgency mm-hmm. is so big. It's like, I have to respond. It has to be big. It has to be bold. And I'm wondering just about, you know, what are the small and gentle ways that might, um, might the impact be less of this big bombastic and more of the small and deep. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm. That's, you know, there's been so many, uh, like when we, when we think about community, often I think about, you know, activities, community activities, right. And that, seems like if you want to create community, that's what you do. You put together things that will enrich people's lives and bring people together. But so often the what is in dissonance with the how, you know, the, the, the what is might be really cool, <laughs> you know, something that somebody's put together and then the how that it's done completely undermines the opportunity for that subtle, settling connection that you're talking about. That's where the replication happens. Um, So, you know, it's like impact, outcome, process. 
context, like impact slash outcome. Mm -hmm. People so over focus on that that they forget about process. And then there's some folks who like spend so long in process. I want to poke my eyes out, right? Like it's where you can hold both, where there's some balance mm -hmm. um, that it doesn't have to be perfection in the process, um, good enough, mm -hmm. and but you know attention, right? like some some attention some attunement to the process and like checking in on how your how folks are doing with that and maybe you don't get as far or as close to the outcome and impact that you wanted but that the process in and of itself is an outcome i have to like remind mm -hmm. folks often when they do things like i'll do equity work and i'm like you don't get to equity without practicing equity so the, an equitable process even if your outcome isn't exactly the same kind of equitable policy or thing that you wanted it's um that process in and of itself leaves people with um, greater skills at replication a different feeling a different way of relating and that's what knits together community right it's like how we relate to relate um so it isn't mm -hmm. just like oh we had a and the struggle of that sounds like mm -hmm, too mm -hmm. it's not just like oh we had we did a great activity like you said we did this great thing and then everyone leaves and goes home to their own little bubbles and in the process what might have happened had we done the process differently had we brought in more slowness more attention more agency even though it's like maybe that took a little bit longer or it was a little more frustrating right when you've got more cook, cooks mm -hmm. in the kitchen Kind of along those lines. Uh, so your work is not only about helping others build the capacity to climb out of their trauma or more effectively manage their stress. For you, this is not the end game. It is about building this capacity so that we can feel free in our bodies to meet life on life's terms. Would you say that's true? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's not resilience for resilience sake. It's like, what are you doing mm -hmm. with that resilience? Yeah. You know, more joy, more pleasure, more freedom, more connection. Again, um, not that neoliberal sense of freedom. It's like a a connected, um, a connected freedom. Um, like shared responsibility, creativity. It's like all those things that you can do with that resilience is what's interesting um, to me. And the wisdom that you've learned mm -hmm. from your trauma, like what was the learning? What was the growth that you don't just throw it out? Like it's not, okay, that's in the past. Like mm -hmm. there's- Post-traumatic Yeah, growth. there's some growth from it. Um, yeah, you don't want to like forget. Um, I don't think forgetting is the balm that we're looking for. It's a different relationship too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No. no, no, that was a nice encapsulation. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Um, so Life then is about change, and yet our dysfunctional systems and the containers we build for community are often too rigid or fragile to hold change. Um, drawing from Sam Kaner's diamond participation model and your own deep experience in social change work, uh, can you talk about the grown <laughs> zone and how understanding and honoring its role is so crucial for where we are right now? I think people have, you know, this idea of you get that whenever you're in a generative process, the easy answers come first, right? Like boop, boop, boom, typically, typically, not always. Mm -hmm. And then the more wild answers, the more out there answers start to come in and you, the divergence happens. And it's like, oof, that's a lot to hold all the possibilities. And I find, you know, most of us, due to our discomfort with things feeling messy, feeling chaotic, we want things buttoned up, we want them buttoned up quickly, we want impact now, it's intolerable. We can't tolerate what's known as that groan zone, that place of divergence, where if we really, like people who love diversity, 
like, I'm like, you know, if everyone agrees really easily, you don't have a lot of diversity in the room, right? And so like you love diversity yeah. until you actually have to wrestle with, oh, wait, there are diverse perspectives here. Oh, wait. And again, people like love their diversity and then want it, but want it nicely packaged, like be diverse, but not that diverse. Um, mm. You know, new ideas, but not that, or like innovative, but that's not that innovative. Like my favorite is when people say like, we want something innovative. And then they ask, can you show us where it's worked before? I'm like, it's innovative. It's never worked anywhere. Um, and so does the inability to tolerate the messy um, into the unknown and having faith that if we sit with it together, really deeply listening to all the perspectives that we will be able to have some convergence to be able to test and try things. Um, but you often it's hard to sit in that place. One, we don't have the, the individual intrapersonal skills, but we also tend not to trust each other really well. Um, and it's a one-upmanship. And I meant manship there. Like me, like my idea, <laughs> me, I need to be heard. Um, what about me? Um, I very rarely hear people say, what about us? Like, what is the solution or solutions here? It, it, just imagine if your your starting point was what about me versus what about us? Like, how you would approach solution finding in a very different way if it's what about us? Because then you really want to hear what other people's needs and concerns are and hopes and dreams. And what about us can we find? That? So that situation is is the way you situate that question. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's a lot of work, it seems like, that a group or even, I mean, think it in uh, romantic relationships even, but within groups, the work you would have to do just to be able to ask that question. Genuinely. Holding mm -hmm. the other. Yeah, and yeah. that, you know, so do we have the relational fabric to ask what about us? And you know, so many people will say that community, community, community. Mm -hmm. And then I'm like looking at how they function. And it's a lot about me, 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 me in a circle. So. <laughs> um, exactly. Yeah. 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 Recently, I came across this term ontological shock. Hmm. Uh, it's been used to describe the existential crisis about stuff like life in outer space and the existence of UFOs and that kind of thing. But um, from what I'm seeing in my communities, I don't know about you, but many of us are experiencing varying degrees of this right now about everything. Um, and it feels like we're traversing a collective grown zone. Um, you know, some of us are witnessing the horrors of genocide for the very first time, uh, observing the inaction or doubling down uh, as a response. We're seeing hard-won human rights laws crumble, uh, racist, ableist, cis, heterosexist agendas uh, get strengthened, and the ravages of ecocide or nature side. Um, all around us under late stage capitalism. Um, you know, even the tech world is feeling this very acutely now with the advent of our AI being on the scene. So for many, for many, it may feel like we're dying. Um, it's like we're all frozen, uh, trying to grasp these new realities and figuring out what we must do and who we must become in the face of it all. And at the same time, I can't help but think that we're in a birthing process as well. Uh, like literally the ring of fire, you know, that moment of <laughs> intense painful stretch before uh, the birth of something new. And so 
I would just love to hear your thoughts, any thoughts you have about that um, and where you think we are now and what we might be needing. I don't know. I mean, everybody's crisis is the worst crisis. I have a client who shared that their grandparent has been multiply displaced in multiple genocides. Mm. And is quite elderly. I think she's in her 80s. Um, and how she loves to garden now. And she's with her plants. And that, like, with the grandchildren. And, like, what my client would said is, like, there's a sense that life goes on. Like, life is bigger than, you know, what we perceive to be this... Um, this is the worst thing ever because the planet will go on with or without us. <laughs> I mean, like, right. It's not going to actually explode yet. <laughs> um, yeah. And so there's like, um, yes, there's a lot going on. And when you, we are in crisis inside of ourselves, we see crisis everywhere and we see nothing different. I mean, I, I think back, you know, to practicing as a midwife and I always thought it was so funny when a, somebody was newly pregnant and they start care and one of, you know, you're in conversation and they just say, oh, pregnant people are everywhere. And I'm like, you're right, they are. But they had never noticed because they were never pregnant themselves. And suddenly it's all they can see. We are amazing pattern recognition machines. If I'm in crisis, I see crisis. If I feel calm, I see calm. They both exist simultaneously. And so is there a crescendo? Is it a crescendo because we, are, we have media and we are more aware of the crescendo? It's bad. Um, is it darkest before dawn? I don't know. Maybe it's just going to keep getting dark. I, don't, I really don't know. And I know babies are born and I know that there's joy. And I look out my window and I see flowers blooming and I see hummingbirds like flitting around there. I know that that is also true. And so I think, you know, part of it is what is the expansion of our lens? Mm -hmm. The more stressed, more crisis I'm oriented, the smaller my lens. And then everything is filled with that crisis. And there are some, I mean, truly horrible things. I just found out that an old colleague has lost 75 family members in Gaza. Yeah, I just oh, found this out today. God. We worked together, shared offices for years. And, you know, like that is true. And the flowers are also still blooming mm. out here. Like both things are true. Are they equal? No. <laughs> right? Um, and so... Um, I don't want to be Pollyanna about it. I don't want to minimize anybody's mm -hmm. suffering. I don't want to spiritually bypass. It's so many both and, both and, both and. And I don't know, we won't know what the end result is. Is this a birth or is this a death until time? I know, mm -hmm. how, all I can know is how I want to be right now. I want to be relational. I want to... Um, be courageous. Uh, I want to hold on to joy and I want to keep my heart open so I can weep and bear witness. I want to move my hands. I want to move my feet. I want to like, and I don't know about some of those larger things. And so I think it's like, um, and that's okay to not know. Because mm -hmm. It's like, this is a false set. If I could say, yes, it's a birth or yes, it's a death, then I have some false sense of security and control because I've named the thing. Hmm. And what if it's both happening simultaneously, right? Something that's often said, right? Something has to die in order to be born. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so just, you know, when is the naming of the thing 
critical because it gives us a perspective and a way to relate a shorthand, a shared vocabulary, a shifting of our perspective that allows us to move and relate and be in a different way. And when is the naming just for our like comfort? And is that okay? Like, okay, now I have a name for the thing. And now I feel more comfortable because it's named instead of amorphous. And when does that naming um, preclude and shut down any further curiosity, any further way of relating differently? I think this is such an uncomfortable mm -hmm. moment with polycrisis that a lot of the naming, I think, is a way for us to wrap our hands around, around something. Which again, if it keeps you being able to stay relational, to stay connected to by naming something versus just throwing your hands up and curling into a ball um, for long periods of time, then name it. <laughs> um, but a name is not the thing. It's just the name. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, don't confuse like though don't confuse like the moment to moment uh ways that we need in order to navigate i guess with the thing itself you're saying yeah um i'm thinking about people who are particularly sensitive to patterns like the hyper pattern recognition folks, um, folks that are, you know, taking in a lot more sensory information on a regular basis. And you also have histories, you know, histories in their bodies of these certain patterns. So I guess, how do we take care of each other? You know, what are the things that we need to do to take care of each other uh, and ourselves, right, um, in these times when we're, so many of us are feeling these things so acutely, and also trying not to go to those old ways of nailing it down into a thing. Right. Or trying to make like something the, perfect. You're trying to get you're in awareness of, of it, you know, and you're like, I'm nailing this down because I it's intolerable for me otherwise and I can't move or operate. Like at least you know what you're doing. I don't then it's not like a surprise, like, oh, I didn't realize that I was doing that. Um mm -hmm. you know, I think there's lots of ways that we take care of ourselves and each other. Um you know, grace. Grace is a nice word. It's a nice act. Mm. How are we giving ourselves grace? How are we extending grace to others? I find the demand for perfect urgency leading to this demand for perfection of ourselves and others really um, stiffens relationships between each other and our capacity to mm. extend care because we're like, what if I do it in the wrong way? What if I don't say it right? What if I leave somebody out? Uh, what if I, and so then I'm not going to say anything. So we end up quite paralyzed for, and so just if there was more spaciousness and more grace about, we would be more, I think, willing to make mistakes. Like, let me try the thing. I could be more courageous because I know that I can afford myself grace and others. Um, I think balance um, seems to be the word that's coming up for me quite a bit. Like no one can do everything. Mm -hmm. And um, the ability to be okay with some things being undone. Some things are going to fall mm -hmm. apart and some things are going to be undone. And that's how are we okay with giving ourselves grace that we've done as much as we can and that we can rest. So it's like an balance between maybe do I need to be a little uncomfortable? Can I push into a little bit of discomfort? Um, what that might that look like? Um, 
I, I'm going to vote for the question that was, what about us? What about us as a question that oftentimes I find principles or questions are really good ways to, rather than giving a prescription, this is what must happen. It's if you keep asking a question together, like yourself and together, what about us? What about us? If we keep asking that question, we'll probably live into a place where we are caring for one another pretty nicely. Mm. The question, what about us, could also be the principle of love. What if, what if we centered love here over and over again? What does love mean? So we would start talking about what does love mean? What does it look like? What does it feel like? And we might start behaving a little bit more aligned with love. So you can either use a principle or a question versus a prescription or a roadmap. Mm -hmm. And we sort of wrestle in that wiggly, messy space together and figure that out. And you have to keep asking, right? Like, oh, so we asked it and what happened? We asked what about us and what happened? Mm -hmm. Oh, I noticed I started calling you more and checking on you. Oh. And then you were more quick to respond. And, you know, so we can evaluate what happened, what changed when we kept asking that question. Mm -hmm. And then ask it again. There is, oh, yes. There is so much uh, skepticism, which I think is just a cover for fear, but there's so much skepticism in our ability to make community, uh, in our ability to have um, an egalitarian society with so much divisiveness, to have um, collective decision making. We're told it takes too long, uh, it's too messy, nothing will ever get done, uh, somebody has to be in charge and make decisions. So what do you what do you say to that? You know, sometimes in an emergency, someone does need to be in charge and make decisions. But not everything is an emergency. Again, if you're in crisis, everything feels like a crisis. So you think every decision needs to be made that way. If you were bleeding out right now, Sam, I think you would want someone to take charge and make a decision to do some life-saving action because you're bleeding out. You wouldn't be like, hey, let's make a collective decision. What do y'all think we should do for Sita? She bleeding out on the ground you wouldn't want it so i don't think it's like sometimes there needs to be hierarchy and sometimes that you know it, it, it's just when we are in crisis everything becomes needs to have a hierarchical and command and control response and so the settling and the slowing that we can do allows us to recognize we actually do have time for a collective process here so here's where some embodiment allows us to live into collective processes because we can mm. become aware is, wow, I'm really keyed up. Is this useful right now? Oh, wait, I'm really keyed up. I probably not. Oh, I can settle a little bit. It allows me to cooperate, collaborate, step into mutuality. But if it's if I see crisis at, at every turn, it's not tolerable. Like So part of not being able to tolerate the grown zone or the point of big divergence and diversity is the sense of crisis. But mind you, we want people to take climate collapse as serious. We want people to feel the crisis of genocide, right? And we want people to be spacious mm -hmm. enough to do peace building. This is mm -hmm. a embodied ask. These are embodied capacities to hold the grief, mm -hmm. to hold the urgency and not let it collapse your strategy, not let it collapse your relationality, not let it constrain the vision of what is possible and the ability to ask, what about mm -hmm. us in the midst of? And so it, these are continuums mm -hmm. of like how much crisis, how much, you know, right? And it's very, you know, when we have built a lot of relational trust over time, it becomes much easier when a crisis arises to trust one another to take a lead. You take it. It's okay. We have built some um, mutual trust over time. It doesn't just happen overnight. And so, again, when everyone's in pulled in a million directions, hurry, hurry, hurry. Keep a roof over your head. 
there's a reason that that really serves this, the economic and political system for us to be so scattered and stretched and pressed. Mm -hmm. So where are the little places we can snatch back a little more spaciousness, a little bit more um, awareness, a little bit more reflectiveness so that we can ask those questions and center those principles. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm looking at the time. <laughs> so let me just ask you this last question here. Um, your vision. Mm -hmm. Vision post-transformation. You know, like I think about how like important it is for us to imagine, right? Because that's what allows us to step in yeah and so as we so with so many people focused on the right here and now the poly crisis as you say um what's your vision for how communities and organizations might emerge not that there's going to be like boop we're done now the crisis is over <laughs> But what do you hold in terms of hope or vision for the future beyond this reckoning that we're in right now? I mean, my feet are here and I'm present. So my vision can only, it, I can imagine a certain level. And as I get a little more free, I can imagine a little more. And as I get a little freer, I get a, can imagine a little more. And so I think this is the process. Like it, um, so I imagine where that question, what about us, easily flows, and we know how to do of extend grace, how we have that love ethic, if I want to cite in and pull in a bell hooks here, um, where, you know, calling each other into our highest self of, you know, respect, and learning together, enjoying together, caring for one another, this deep sense of mutuality, and when I mean each other, I don't just mean human, I mean more than human, all of us. Um, it puts a smile on my face. There's ease, uh, there's spaciousness, there's joy. Um, it's not that things can't be hard, people die. It's no, you know, we're not living forever, little Futurama heads in jars. Um, and we know how to hold it each other through that and so it's a practice of doing that right we we rehearse the freedoms now as best as we can with the constraints that we have and we get a little better at doing it it's a skill like nothing else right as like anything else practicing mm -hmm. thank you for tuning in my freaky and feral friends if this episode left you wanting more, check out the show notes below for ways to connect with Inchem and Lumos Transforms, as well as links to the resources we discussed in this episode. Want to share how this episode made you feel? Join the conversation. Like and comment below, and don't forget to share your ideas. Until next time, rock on in love.